Hello and welcome to this latest podcast in our series on the early 19th century German writer Heinrich von Kleist. I'm Steve Howe from the University of Exeter and I'm joined by Professor Ricardo Schmidt, also from the University of Exeter, and Dr Sean Allen from the University of Warwick. And today we will be talking about another of Kleist's stories, the Marquise of O. First published in 1808 and later revised in 1810, the story is arguably Kleist's best known work of fiction. The subject matter is introduced, fairly typically for Kleist, by way of a quite startling opening line, which here tells of an announcement which the widowed Marquise of O, a lady of unblemished reputation, as the narrator notes, has placed in the local newspaper. There we read that, quote, She had, without knowledge of the cause, come to find herself in a certain situation, that she would like the father of the child she was expecting to disclose his identity to her, and that she was resolved, out of consideration for her family, to marry him. So if we could perhaps start with you, Sean, could you give us a brief sense of how and why it comes to this quite extraordinary step on the Marquise's part? There's an attack on the citadel where the Marquise lives. She's just on the point of being raped by a gang of low-ranking Russian soldiers, and she's rescued by the Count F, the main male protagonist in the story. And he's, of course, the man who eventually confesses to being the father of this child, because as she lies unconscious, she's impregnated by the Count F. I use the word impregnated because there is some debate, I think, in the critical literature as to whether it is a rape or not a rape, I personally see it quite unambiguously as a, as a rape. As the story unfolds, I think there's absolutely no doubt that the Count F is the rapist and that he's the father of the child. And, in fact, at the end of the story, the mother says when he turns up, who else have we been expecting? And that's revealed through a series of clues over the course of the text. Yes, uh, not just a series of clues, I think some very, very obvious allusions and statements. Uh, a contemporary reviewer writing on this story said, you can sh soon tell how it's all going to end out. So I think it's fair to say, too, that even in Kleist's day, there's no ambiguity about who is the father of the child. And so alongside the question of the identity of the father, I think the opening line also raises certainly curiosity um, on the part of the readers as to how it could possibly be that the Marquise has fallen pregnant without her knowledge. I think we, the three of us would agree that it's unambiguously a rape. Though readers and commentators, both in Kleist's own time, and in our own, have questioned the Marquise's innocence and suggested that um, she is in fact guilty of suppressing sexual knowledge, that she's somehow complicit in the act. Ricardo, if you could perhaps firstly sense of the lines upon which those types of readings are constructed and secondly, you know, what you would make of them. The story has the Marquise learned that uh, the Count, who first appeared to her like an angel from heaven, uh, towards the end he appears to her like the devil. So she has to learn about human frailty, that there's not an easy division between good and evil, uh, angel and devil, uh, but there's all these shades of grey. Now, understandably, um, this uh, attempt to map out uh, the human frailty in the 20th century was then being applied uh, to women as well. In the story itself, it's the Marquise who has to make this discovery and apply it uh, to her relationship with the Count. Um, in the 20th century, um, Critics wanted to apply the same kind of insight into human frailty into the Marquise herself. So how did they do that? They were trying to attribute to her uh, some dark side, and the dark side uh, is sexual desire, repressed sexual desire. Um, and critics hung it on uh, the connotations of the verb to know and knowledge. Uh, it was interpreted uh, as uh, biblical knowledge, carnal knowledge. So sentences in which uh, anything with knowing and knowledge appeared uh, were read in this sexual sense. And in one scene, the Marquise says uh, to the Count when he comes to woo her in the garden that she doesn't want to know anything. And critics said, oh, she is trying to repress sexual knowledge. 
I think that is quite misguided because uh, in that scene, the Marquise by then has discovered her pregnancy and has decided um, that for family considerations, she wants to marry her rapist in order to give the father a child. And um, the Count coming to woo her again, because she doesn't associate him with the rape, seems to be the wrong man. So, you know, she, she quite likes him, but doesn't want to um, have him as the wrong man. She doesn't feel she's worthy of him, having been in this strange situation. So I think it's understandable that 20th century critics are trying to, you know, uh, establish equality and not view women as so pure. But I think this story is actually hinged uh, that the Marquise is as pure in order for the whole frailty of the world not to uh, lead into utter chaos. You know, she is the uh, Archimedean point in this story where everything else turns out to be um, not black and white but grey. But, you know, uh, she, uh, I would argue, uh, is um, the firm uh, moral centre that doesn't waver. I would certainly agree with you on that reading and I think it's interesting that this idea that the Marquise isn't perhaps as pure as she maintains is also rehearsed in the story itself. I mean the father, the commandant, her brother, they all take this very sceptical view of her sexuality and I think it's a view that's shown to be misguided and indeed even that if you think about that epigram that Kleist wrote when he satirised contemporary reactions to the novel mm -hmm. he says um, this is not a novel for you my daughter unconscious what a brazen performance I'm telling you all she, she just did it with her eyes shut and of course readers at Kleist's time also found it hard to believe but I think that's precisely the power of the story as you so rightly pointed out. Yes, and I think uh, Kleist uh, wasn't trying to make her out uh, as aiming for female emancipation. The story has often been read as a story of female emancipation because um, when she finds herself pregnant, all the world is against her. Uh, the world primarily meaning her father, her mother, her brother. She's uh, cast out of the house. Um, so socially isolated and in this social isolation she finds it in herself to resist uh, her quite violent uh, father, the famous pistol shot. Um, but in a, typian, a typical uh, Kleistian reversal, you know, when uh, something happens that could crush her, she then finds power to resist this. But it's a resistance uh, that is not aimed at an overthrow of patriarchy because at no point does she ever um, want independence. Uh, she, she doesn't reject the authority of her parents. Uh, at all times she honours and loves them. Um, so what she is acting out of uh, is... A, a sense of uh, honourability, uh, obligation, and that goes back, uh, interestingly, to Cicero, um, to act in an honourable way. Uh, for Cicero means uh, that uh, you've got uh, everybody in life has uh, different uh, obligations and they've got to be weighed up. Um, and uh, Honor, honourable obligations derive from those that pursue truth. Um, second, um, justice and benevolence. And third, uh, which uh, display magnanimity. And fourth, um, order and measure in her actions. So the Marquise, um, when she decides after finding herself pregnant, um, she wants to find the father of her child. It would be easier for herself if she didn't, but she does it for the sake of the child. So she acts honorably to protect somebody weaker than herself. Um, and she is trying to find out the truth, whereas it would have been much easier for her uh, had she tried to follow the midwife's advice of how to cover it up. Um, so her uh, acting honourably 
means uh, that she puts uh, a lot of what is regarded um, as proper feminine behavior as secondary because she prioritizes the interests of the unborn child. So in those terms, Ricardo, you would think that um, the Marquisa is presented by Christ in the text as an embodiment of a kind of feminine virtue, a particular model. Yes, uh, but interestingly, uh, he shows feminine virtue as uh, much more complex um, because it shows there are contradicting demands uh, on feminine virtue. And the Marquisa is strong enough uh, to accept the censure of the world uh, in order to protect uh, a weak person, well, the unborn child. It's interesting, too, because if you compare this story with another story that Kleist wrote that's related in some way, it's called, I think, A Remarkable Occurrence That Occurred During a Sojourn in Italy, and there a maid becomes pregnant, and there is, if you like, a kind of cover-up where the, the princess organises a husband for her maid, mm -hmm. Francisca. And I think in this story, The Marquise of Fumeau, we get a lot of attempts to try and provide sort of pseudo-conventional solutions. I mean, as the Count knows mm -hmm. that he's the father of the child, he turns up immediately and proposes in this very impetuous mm -hmm. way that he would like to marry the Marquise. Everyone's taken mm -hmm. aback, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting that this is a sort of solution that that would, in fact solve appearances, but I mm -hmm. think that that points to the more radical dimension of the story, which is, of course, at, lies at its ethical heart. And mm -hmm. if I was to come back to that uh, very rich phrase that you were talking about, I don't want to know anything, ich will nichts wissen, she says. And I, I always think, what is it that she doesn't want to know? And of course, what she doesn't want to be told by the Count is that even though you have been raped, you are innocent, because she, of course, she knows that she is innocent. She doesn't need to be told that. Of course, I find what's what's the, the heart of the story is that the count really has to confess, "I am the guilty person," and that's mm. really what makes this story so powerful yeah. and so and, so radical. And because the count hasn't done that, and because he appeared like an angel, um, you know, all the obvious clues, she is just unable to interpret them. Which, of course, makes for um, the rich irony, uh, the humour of the story. So it, it's quite remarkable that uh, Kleist managed to write a, a serious story about rape, which is at the same time immensely funny, immensely comical. Yes, I think that's a side of Kleist's work that's very often overlooked, this dark uh, humour. And mm. I think that's something that's made him of particular interest, I think, to 20th yeah. century readers. I certainly see that would be a connection. Sometimes yeah. these conventions are hard to embrace, I think, for us in our contemporary world. But this humour, I think, was something that particularly appealed to Franz Kafka. There's, mm. a, I think, a line of continuity there in their style. Yes, and it even goes far back, because uh, it goes back to Rousseau's Nouvelle Louise. And uh, mm. it's well known that N Nouvelle Louise is uh, a source uh, for the reconciliation scene between father and daughter. Mm. But it's also a source with regard to the family constellation. I mean, in uh, Rousseau's um, Julie or the Nouvelle, uh, New Eloise, um, the father is described uh, as um, an old soldier who was obstinate about the honor of his house. And Rousseau's father figure is described as a person of violent temper, a bit of a tyrant, um, flaring into a rage very easily. So so, and the mother is conciliatory. So that uh, same uh, family constellation, Kleist takes over. And in uh, Nouvelle Louise, um, the um, heroine is not innocent. She actually had uh, sex with her lover illicitly. And the irony comes that her father knows uh, of the love affair but doesn't suspect that it actually has been sexually consummated. And um, there's uh, the scene where uh, Julie tells uh, the story how her father actually berated her uh, and he actually hit her. Mm. Um, and calls her names is really violent and, and unpleasant and, um, you know, blood flows because he hits her so badly that she, she falls, falls over. 
And uh, Julie comments that all the time while he called her all sorts of bad names, he never suspected that she'd actually had sex with this man. So uh, that, you know, uh, to, to suspect, to, to notice something and criticize it, and yet completely failing to get the point, that is something he got from Rousseau and then transferred it onto the Count, because the family are making all sorts of remarks about the Count's odd behaviour without suspecting for a moment how close they are to the truth. Um, and uh, Kleist has certainly uh, put a lot of things in that Rousseau mm. didn't, because in Rousseau uh, it's the daughter who initiates mm. and manufactures this reconciliation scene. He, she is the one who kisses the father in Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Here it's the other way round. The Marquise is lying back and uh, the father covers her with kisses uh, like a lover. Um, so the, the emotions involved uh, in the father who had idolized the daughter, who had apparently betrayed him, uh, and then being convinced that he was wrong and she is as pure as uh, he had wanted her to be, uh, just releases uh, emotions that... Uh, well, I, I have to confess, I find them still <laughs> quite hard to bear. Would you say that's fairly typical for what Kleist does in terms of engaging with literary predecessors? Because as you say, there's so much that he does take from Rousseau in that scene, certain of the elements, um, even the fact that the father can't express his guilt mm -hmm. um, is very much in the Rousseau as well. Um, but Kleist takes it in such a... or pushes it to such extremes, yes. so to speak. And yeah. if he does, why do you think necessarily... I think uh, he is basically uh, an idealist who nevertheless likes uh, to test uh, the ideals against reality because um, he l wants the ideals and yet uh, notices the discrepancies between the ideals and reality. So he, he is somebody who in his writing sets up uh, well, uh, little examples and tests them to the limit. I would see this also as a as a way of exploring the way in which certain kinds of ideals become conventionalised. That mm -hmm. there is a sort of genuine moral impulse, or whether for good or for evil, actually, in terms mm -hmm. of the rate, mm -hmm. and this becomes reduced to a set of formulaic conventions that characters f form. And I think it was always interested in these literary models that give you a kind of pattern of how yeah. to act, but yet somehow actually obscure the real moral content of the action. And I think here this story, part of the humour derives from the fact that the characters are trapped in a certain type of conventional world and have to negotiate their positions despite the blindingly obvious with which they're confronted. And that, that allows for a kind of humour, I think precisely that kind of black humour that we were talking about. I always think that the, the, the if we come to the, the figure of the father, the father is sort of trapped in this conventional world where he's he, I mean, he has to follow these kind of military conventions as he, mm -hmm. he surrenders his citadel mm -hmm. and he says, Mm -hmm. He wanted to surrender the whole time, but he'd just been waiting for an order to do so. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I think his convention-bound behaviour results in a kind of hysterical personality, almost, that he shoots from one extreme to the other. This, I mean, of all the characters in the novella, he has these very, very violent mood swings. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, the father is very much criticised uh, for that, and he, he nearly loses uh, his power in the family because of that. So, um, you know, I, I think although the Marquise um, stands up against her father uh, when he wants to take away the children from her, um, it doesn't mean that uh, patriarchy as such is being criticised. What is being criticised is somebody who hasn't got uh, what uh, Cicero uh, argued was um, order and measure in his behaviour because he always overreacts, um, reacts in a violent way, whereas the Marquise herself, although she stands up against her father, she always uh, has the order and measure in, in her behaviour and in that she herself is a model of moral behaviour. Uh, because, you know, when her mother comes to see her in her country estate, 
uh, she immediately rushes out and falls on her knees before the coach uh, in which her mother sits. And, uh, you know, uh, she says uh, she had never stopped to love and honour her and it was completely understandable given the situation that nobody could believe her. So she is uh, full of empathy and measure and respect, uh, shows respect to her both her parents at all times. I think you're right that I don't think this novella challenges what I would call patriarchal structures, but I th- I'm interested in the way in which, in the novella, the reactions to the pregnancy have very... Have a, there's a very different sort of reaction according to the gender of the person, mm. because if we, the, mm. another character we haven't talked about yet is the midwife, and it always seems to me that the midwife and the mother, they have a rather different attitude to sort of sexual relations, mm. because the mother says, if you'd had sex with somebody, I would find that pretty reprehensible, but it's something I, for which I could forgive mm. you. Mm. Actually, yeah. the brother mm. and the father yeah. couldn't really forgive yeah. her for mm. that. I think yes. that's very clear. Yes. And, of course, the midwife, yeah. she says, oh, you know, all these ladies who thought they lived on desert islands, you know, in mm. the end, mm. the gay corsair turns yeah. up yeah. and so on. And, of yeah. course, she is a, a, a wheeler and a dealer, yeah. a fixer yeah. of, and she yeah. understands that for these mm. aristocratic families, what, mm. what matters really is, of course, yeah. that everything turns out nicely, mm. as yeah. she so eloquently puts yes. it. But what is so interesting is that um, whenever somebody who has power, like the Count, like uh, the the father, uh, if they don't show measure and control in their behaviour, they are threatened with losing it. And it's the women who both... um, are agents into making them lose it, but ultimately in this story also to regain Abs- it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, because in the end, after the father has humiliated uh, himself uh, in the reconciliation scene and the mother insisted, he comes here, you don't go to him, and, you know, he, he comes mm-hmm. and, and asks for, uh, for forgiveness after he's done that. Uh, when the Marquise then finds out uh, who her rapist was and doesn't want to marry him, the father insists you must marry him and uh, the father negotiates uh, negotiates the marriage contract. So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, with the moderate behaviour, uh, the measured moral behaviour, the honourable behaviour of the women, uh, patriarchy is shorn up again. And that's something which also has an intriguing um, background in Rousseau. I mean, if you read uh, his Julie, this Julie, although, uh, you know, she uh, tries to conform to feminine virtues, um, apart from her fall, um, but, you know, she orders her lover about mm. quite a lot and says, well, you know, uh, once he is drunk and um, behaves uh, sexually aggressive inappropriately to her, uses bad language, and she tells him, uh, you know, either you renounce me or you merit my esteem. Bang! Mm. Um, so uh, the, the, the moral stance they take, and, and I find that is really intriguing, the power... Uh, that women have in patriarchy. Um, It's a sort of um, a soppy sentimentalist uh, view to think the power consists of rejecting patriarchy. Women have a lot more power if they embrace patriarchy and can say morally on the high ground, well, you know, I'm behaving honourably and properly, etc. And and the men don't because they are uh, falling for their passions rather than being measured. Mm -hmm. So that is what gives them a lot more power than opposing patriarchy outright. Kleist is absolutely fantastic in showing that uh, following, protecting the interests of the children, women can outgrow their role in in patriarchal society in so many other ways, but they don't ever intend to outgrow it. You know, Uh, Mm -hmm. their power is completely based on the acceptance of the patriarchal role of the self-sacrificing mother. I would cite that. They haven't got power. They haven't got power for themselves. You know, they're never rulers, uh, successful rulers in their own right or independence. No, uh, their strength lies completely in the moral behavior in protecting others and where they're so honorable that 
you know, they make all sorts of sacrifices, they offend all sorts of norms because that is such a priority, this honourable behaviour protecting weaker ones. And in this story we've got the happy ending uh, because uh, he's of the same rank and they can marry and she is magnanimous enough to forgive him. And, and that does only occur eventually. The, the yeah. point that Sean was alluding to in the text where the initial reaction when she finds out that the Count mm -hmm. is the rapist and she has this where she announces that, yes, she was prepared to, to meet a, a vicious man but not a devil. Then she um, uh, throws holy water over mm -hmm. her parents and her brother. I mean, yeah. what do you think the Marquise is experiencing at that point? Utter, utter shock because, uh, you know, sh she had idealised him uh, into an angel and uh, you know when he came back to her and wanted to renew the wooing uh, she just thought oh he knew that she was pregnant and he was uh, being very kind but she just had never connected um, that moment uh, to a possible rape so this shock that her idealization was misplaced uh, that he has misused uh, her trust betrayed her trust uh, is a very deep shock for the Marquise. Okay, I think that brings us to a nice close. Thank you very much, Ricardo Schmidt and Sean Allen. <laughs>